Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal from Continuing Church of God. Today I want to talk about physical protection during the time of the Great Tribulation. What's going to happen? Are any of God's people going to be protected from the Great Tribulation? Well, according to Jesus, the answer is yes. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to read a couple of verses starting in verse uh, 20 uh, from the New King James Version of the Bible. Something that Jesus taught. And pray that your flight not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there should be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor shall ever be. Now Jesus is giving a warning. Now some people think he's only warning uh, non-Christians, but he's actually also warning Christians. And there are basically two groups uh, the Bible shows going, during this time of Christians. A group that's going to be protected and a group that's not. So let's go to the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to start in verse 13. It says, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Now we realize that there's been persecutions in the church from the beginning. But we're talking about a persecution here just before the time of the Great Tribulation. I'm not going to go there, but you can read about this in Daniel chapter 11, verses 28 to 35, for example, where the king of the north gets angry with the Holy Covenant and starts to persecute, which is consistent with this passage here. It, I believe, ties in with Revelation 12, 13. So what happens? Verse 14, But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she's nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. So we see more persecution happening. Something is going to happen when these people are fleeing. But notice what happens in verse 16. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon has spewed out of his mouth. This also ties in with uh, Daniel, uh, but I'm not going to go there now. Anyway, verse 17, And the dragon was enraged with the woman. And what did he do? He went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we're talking about Christians here, because Christians are the ones who have the testimony of Jesus Christ, and Christians are the ones who should be keeping the commandments as well. Now, some may try to keep the commandments who aren't Christian, but we see two different groups. So just believing in Jesus and being a true Christian and keeping the Ten Commandments does not mean you're necessarily going to be protected. So we see that after this persecution, the woman's going to fly into her place. Now, this is a, in the wilderness. Because it's a wilderness, it's not a, the rapture, if you will, which uh, various ones teach. Uh, it's becoming less popular in evangelical circles, but there's a teaching there that prior to the start of the Great Tribulation, Jesus will return and carry, bring all the people up, all the Christians up with him. But the reality is that's not what the Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that some portion, but only a part of the church, is going to be protected. And it's going to be protected in the wilderness, where they're nourished for time, times, and half a time, which is three and a half years. In Daniel 7, verse 25, I wasn't planning on going there, but let's go there. Daniel 7, verse 25. I want to read about a couple different persecutions there. Daniel 7, verse 25. It's talking about the beast, the king of the north power. And he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, and shall persecute the saints of the Most High. Now, you can read about that, as I mentioned before, in Daniel 11, verses 28, let's say through 36 or 37. So this is just prior to the start of the Great Tribulation. But then, he's, it says he's going to intend to change times and laws, and then the saints are going to be given to him to his hand for a time, times, and half a time. The same period of time that we read about in Revelation chapter 12. But it can't be all the saints giving into his hand, because again, we read it in Revelation 12, verses 14 through 17, a portion of the church is protected, and the rest are not. So we see this, this happening. Now, I want to read something that Jesus taught in Luke chapter 21. And I want to start in verse 34. Jesus himself warned, But take heed to yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, 
and that day come upon you unexpectedly. So Jesus is warning that a lot of people won't know when it's going to be until it's too late. Verse 35 says, For it comes a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Well, those who dwell on the face of the whole earth are going to think humanity is going to solve its own problems, and they don't think that the end is about to come. Now, what does Jesus say to do about this? Ignore it? No. In verse 36, he says, To watch therefore, and pray always, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. You're supposed to watch and pray always. You may be accounted worthy. You're not just supposed to pray to be accounted worthy. You're going to change and do what God wants you to do, to be accounted worthy to escape. So just being a Christian isn't enough. Because if all Christians were granted this protection, there'd be no reason Jesus would have to give that instruction. In the book of Revelation, especially chapters 2 and 3, we read about seven different churches. Some people believe that uh, this represents church errors. Some people think it's all fulfilled, etc. But the Bible is clear, irrespective of your view on it. And we in the Continuing Church of God, by the way, believe in this concept called church errors. We believe that the attitudes of each of the seven churches existed throughout uh, church history, but there was a predominant attitude and the different ones and different churches uh, and toward the time of the end, most Christians will be Laodicean. But regarding the letter to the church of Philadelphia, in Revelation 3, verses 10 to 11, Jesus says, because you've kept my command to persevere, that's to keep with the proper teachings, I will keep you from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I've come quickly. Hold fast what you have that no man may take your crown. So Jesus is warning the Philadelphian Christians that they could have an issue, but if you go through Revelation 2 and 3, you'll find the only church that's promised specific protection is the Philadelphians, and there's a hint about some from Thyatira. But regarding the letter to the church of the Laodiceans, plural, it says they walk a different path. And Jesus told them in verse 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and re uh, repent. So what's the difference between these two groups? Well, according to Jesus, it's got to do with their works. Revelation uh, 3, verse 8, Jesus said to the Philadelphians, I know your works. I set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. If you have a little strength, you've kept my word and not denied my name. Now, some churches don't seem to think that the open door, for example, includes reaching Gentiles in Africa, which we in the Continuing Church of God have done, or they think that's just a minimal thing and it's not important. But we go through whichever doors Christ opens. Uh, through, we use radio, we use the Internet, uh, we've got various channels and such that we're doing, personal visits, etc. We go through the doors that are open. We don't say, oh... These people are, don't have any money, and they can't support us financially, so we aren't going to deal, deal with them or their, their cost. That's not how we do it. We go through the doors that Christ opens for us. Now, if you go down a few verses, the letter to the Laodiceans starts off pretty much the same word, with the same words. I know your works. In verse 15, but then Jesus says, but you're not cold or hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you're lukewarm, you're neither cold nor hot, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth because you say, I'm rich, I'm wealthy, I don't need anything. We're too good, we don't, we need, to, we don't need things like prophets, and we don't care that uh, our prophetic understandings are not quite right or not as important. I've had people who have a Church of God background basically say to me, look, oh, this prophecy stuff, we've heard this forever, you know, whatever, sometime, some of this will be fulfilled. They don't seem to really believe it's really going to happen. And un unwilling to change and do what it takes. Because they're comfortable. They're comfortable because there's a church close to them. They're comfortable because they like the people or the minister or whatever. They're comfortable. Whereas Jesus says, because you say, I'm rich. I've become wealthy. I need nothing. i got everything I need. Jesus says, you don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. You need to be refined. You need to change. That you may be rich in white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Anoint your eyes with eye salve, you may see. It's only to the Philadelphians that their promise to be kept from the hour of trial. Because they kept the word of Christ's patience, as it says in the Old King James. 
Now, many people who had an old Worldwide Church of God background believe or, uh, that the Philadelphia era existed when uh, the late Herbert W. Armstrong was alive, and he believed it was. And basically, it would only be the true remnant that would be uh, Philadelphia in these days. And it would be the people that Jude referred to in Jude 3, those who were actually contending for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints, which is something in the continuing Church of God that we do. Now, we also put a priority upon proclaiming the gospel, the kingdom of God. And we have a free booklet called The Gospel of the Kingdom of God. This particular booklet is available in between 90 and 100 different languages. You can go to uh, www.ccog.org, click on the literature tab, and you can find all our booklets in English. However, if you just go to www.ccog.org and you scroll down, you'll see a listing of languages. And if you click on the language, one of the 90 or 100 languages that are there, uh, this booklet is there pretty much all the time. You can click on and read it if you prefer a language other than English, or you know people who read languages other than English who might be interested. We are interested in reaching everybody that we can, and using internet with multiple languages is one of the doors that we're going through to proclaim the gospel. Perhaps I should mention that there's a prophecy in Zephaniah 2 warning about uh, Laodiceans that aren't going, to, aren't going to make it. Now, if you look at the Greek, you're going to find a few things out. One is that the word Philadelphia, the Greek comes from, it means fraternal affection or brotherly love or love of the brethren or fond of the brethren. So Philadelphians are interested in helping others, not just say, okay, I just, I have to have a church that's close by, I have to have a church that I like to minister, I have to have a church where the speaker is better, I have to have a church that I like to people, or whatever terms, or, or some people, times people have some quirky personal doctrines. They either have to be accepted by those or taught there for them who accept it. Anyway, they don't seem to have as much love for the brethren or the poor. Now, according to Strong's uh, concordance, the word Laodicea is made up of two words, which means people, oh, laos, which means people, and dike, or dike, which means right, judgment, punish, or vengeance. Basically, uh, well, let's just say it's Smith's Bible Dictionary. It says Smith's Bible Dictionary says Laodicea means justice of the people. And so people feel that they can set the standards and they uh, don't use God's standards. And you say, yeah, but you're Christian, and therefore you're using God's standards. Well, you know, in Jesus' time, we had the Pharisees, and they thought they were God's people, and they were doing things right. And to some degree they were, but they didn't quite get it, just because the fact that they knew some about the Bible and were God's physical people didn't mean that they had it all. And the same thing with the Laodiceans at the time of the end. They think they've got it fine, but they don't. Now, as far as what's going to the Great Tribulation is going to be like, there's many, many passages we could go to. I, I'm going to just read a couple of them. One be from uh, the book of Lamentations, chapter 4. Uh, you might want to go there. I'm going to start with verse 4. How bad this is going to be. The tongue of the infant clings to the roof of its, its mouth for thirst. The young children ask for bread, but no one breaks it for them. Let's go down to verse 9. Those who are slain by the sword are better off than those who die by hunger. Those for the, these pine away, stricken for lack of the fruit of the field. The hands of the compassionate women have cooked their own children. They became food for them in the destruction of the daughter of my people. Let's go down to verse 19. Our pursuers were more swift, were swifter than the eagles of the heavens. They pursued us on the mountains and lay wait for us in the wilderness. So you're talking about a time of warfare, famine, and slavery. People are pursuing them either to kill them or to make them slaves, or probably both, depending on if they think the person could be a good slave or not. They have the right skills or whatever. Now, what happened, what Jeremiah talked about, the Great Tribulation, that's either talking about the Great Tribulation, or tribulation is going to be worse than that. Why do we know this? Because what Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 21. 
For then there shall be great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor shall ever be. Those preterist types who say that tribulation already happened are crazy. What happened in 70 AD in Jerusalem is not the greatest tribulation from the beginning of the world uh, or that ever would be. That, that was not the case. So this is a future event that's going to happen. A portion of God's people fall in the past. You can read that in 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 through 11. And many things were recorded in the Old Testament for our admonition on whom the ends of the ages have come. As it says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12, Therefore let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. In Matthew 24, 21, 22 it says, Unless those days are short, no flesh should be alive. So that seems kind of bleak, but it also says, yet for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. In Jeremiah 30, verse 7, Jeremiah was inspired to write, Alas, for that day is great, so none is like it. And it's the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Yes, God's going to save some of his spirit-begotten children from the physical terror of the tribulation. He's going to d d deliver the remnant of the Philadelphians. Now, I want to read something from Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. I alluded to this before. When I read in Revelation 12 about the earth helping the woman, it seems like this is when this happens. Daniel 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, and it's talking about the archangel, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. So that's what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24, 21. Even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who's found written in the book. Now the expression, at that time, that Hebrew expression is also found in Daniel 11.35. So I believe this provides additional evidence that Michael is going to provide protection to God's people when they fly or flee into the wilderness. As I mentioned before, not everyone is going to be saved, uh, even Christians. We read about that in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, about two types of persecution. The first type of persecution, which happens prior to the start of the Great Tribulation. Then the second part, which happens for a time, times, and half a times, which is during the time of the Great Tribulation, the day of the Lord, which is again the same period of time that we read about in Revelation 12, verse 17. These scriptures tie together. The Old Testament and New Testament both are teaching what's going to happen. Now, most of the non Philadelphian Christians are going to be uh, killed or martyred. Let's go to Revelation chapter 14. It's going to be a difficult time. And I'm going to start in verse, verse 12 with uh, Revelation 14. Because we're going to find out we're talking about Christians here. Here is the patience of the saints. So, okay, we're talking about the saints. Who are the saints? Here are those who keep the commandments of God. And the, and the faith of Jesus. So again, we're talking about Christians. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Now, why would God allow much of the church to go through persecution? Well, in Daniel 11, verse 35, we get a, a, a hint about this. Says, and some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purge them, and make them white until the time of the end, because it's still for the appointed time. And if you're in Daniel, you went over with me, let's go to Daniel 12, verse 10. Excuse me, 9. Start in verse 9. And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white, and refine, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now remember, who's counseled by gold that's been refined? Who's warned they're going to be rebuked and chastened? Well, that was the Laodiceans in Revelation uh, 3, verses 18 through and 19. Even when Babylon the Great is clearly evident in the world scene, 
It seems God's people still need to be reborn because it says in Revelation 18, verse 4, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. And by the way, since I am going through a lot of scriptures and you may not have time to look them all up, at the cogwriter.com website, that's C-O-G-W-R-I-T-E-R.com website, there's an article, a uh, place of safety for the Philadelphians and why a place like Petra might be it. So if I go over some things too quickly, you can go there. Plus, I can tell you, looking at the amount of notes I have and the amount of time, I'm not going to cover everything in that particular paper. So if you want more information on this subject, go to the cogwriter.com website. Now, it looks like in Ezekiel 5, verses 3 to 4, uh, Ezekiel might be referring to protection about people who are God's people. Now, this could be physical descendants, maybe it's spiritual descendants. Ezekiel 5, verses 3, verse 3 says, God says to Ezekiel, You shall take a small number of them and bind them in the edge of your garment. Then take some of them again and throw them in the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire. Now, I should comment if for some reason somebody makes it to the, the, the place of uh, protection, it doesn't mean there won't be any problems, and some could be burnt on the way. You can read about that in Revelation, not Revelation, but in Daniel chapter 11, verse 33. But what about others in places like the United States uh, who are not biblical Christians? Why don't you take the time to go to Amos, Amos chapter 3. While you're going there, I'm going to comment that we have a sermon uh, on our uh, 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 continuing COG uh, program uh, on Samaria and the identification of Samaria and prophecy. And Samaria and prophecy, most of the prophetic references to Samaria have to do with the tribe of Manasseh, which is be best represented in the 21st century by the United States of America. So notice what it says, and Amos was inspired to write, Amos 3, verse 9. Assemble on the mountains of Samaria. See great tumults in their midst, and the oppressed within her. For they do not know to do right, says the Lord, who stored up violence and robbery in their palaces. Therefore, says the eternal God, or Lord God, an adversary shall be around the land. He shall sap your strength from you, and your palaces shall be plundered. Thus says the Lord, and as the shepherd takes from the mouth of the lion two legs of piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out who dwell in Samaria. Now this is kind of interesting because what we're seeing here, it says the children of Israel who dwell in Samaria. That may be, by the way, that people such as perhaps the Mexicans, there are many Mexicans, especially in the southwest portion of the United States, especially in the portions of the United States that were once controlled by Mexico, maybe they will, many of them will be allowed to stay. It says the children of Israel should be taken out who dwell in Samaria. So the implication is maybe everybody else is going to be leaving there. Anyway, in the corner of a bed on the edge of the couch, verse 13, hear and testify against the house of Jacob, says the eternal God or Yahweh God, the God of hosts, that it, in the day I punish Israel for their transgressions, I also visit destructions on the altars of Bethel, and horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. This indicates there's going to be people who are hiding in different places in the mountains in the U.S., and they're not going to make it. Now, where should people be during the time of the Great Tribulation? Well, they should go to the place that God chooses. But a few years ago, I ran into an article called The Ten Safest Countries If World War III Breaks Out. Anyway, World War III will break out. Uh, here's what they listed as the ten safest countries. Number one, they listed Fiji. They say it's uh, remote. It's neutral in foreign affairs. Therefore, that would be a place. And while that is an interesting place to consider, we'll get later why there's danger with that. Uh, the next place was listed was Ireland. Third place was called was an island called Malta. Fourth place was Denmark. Fifth place was Iceland. Followed by... Chile is 6th, Bhutan is 7th, New Zealand is 8th, Tuvalu is ninth, and Switzerland is 10th. But many of those places listed are actually uh, highlands. And they may not be the safest place. In uh, Luke uh, 21, Jesus talks about, verse 11, about various earthquakes, etc. But in verse 25, it says, 
There will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and earth and distress of the nations with perplexity and the sea and the waves roaring. Well, places like uh, Tuvalu are pretty low uh, lying, and they probably won't do so well there. Furthermore, in the book of Revelation, uh, I'm not going to read all of this. I'll just cut down to the chase on this particular one. Revelation 16, verse 20 says, And every island fled away, and mountains were not found. And almost every one of those places I mentioned, matter of fact, every one of those places was either mountainous or an island. <laughs> so according to the Bible, that wouldn't be the way to go. Oh yes, physically, it seems like it makes sense. Uh, my wife and I have been to Fiji a couple of times, and it's remote. Would think that would be fine. People raise their own food there, etc. You know, Paul wrote in Romans 8, verse 6, to be carnally minded is death. So just because these places might appear from a physical perspective to be the place, eh, scripturally doesn't seem to be that way. Now, I'll give you a few more clues of where the place is not going to be. We go to Jeremiah chapter 4, starting in verse 5. Now, some people said the Bible gives no clue about where this place is supposed to be, including people who claim to be Church of God Christians. But the, that's not true. Jeremiah 4, verse 5 says, Declare in Judah and proclaim in Jerusalem and say, Blow the trumpet in the land. Cry, gather together and say, Assemble yourselves. Let us go up to the fortified cities. Set up the standard toward Zion. Take refuge. Do not delay, for I will bring disaster from the north and great destruction. Now, Jesus told his followers in Matthew 24, verses 15 to 16, to see abomination and desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, to, to flee. And we're seeing here we're not supposed to go to the north. So we see that as an issue. Uh, and Jesus also said people... When Jerusalem is surrounded by armies in Luke 20, verses 20 and 21, Luke, excuse me, Luke 21, verses 20 to 21, I'm used to read it. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. And let, the, not, and not, and let not those who are in the country enter her. So we're specifically told Jerusalem is not going to be a place to go. These people should flee uh, toward the mountains. So it should be pretty clear that Jerusalem and Judea is not the place to go. Now people are warned in Jeremiah uh, 50 uh, to flee Babylon and get out of Chaldea. So those wouldn't be the places to go. And Zechariah 2, verses 6 through 7, gives us some more clues. Let me read parts of those. Zechariah 2, verse 6. Flee from the land of the north, says the eternal. Now let's go down to verse 7. Up Zion, escape, you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. So there's going to be some people dwelling with the daughter of Babylon, which would be in Europe, and you're supposed to escape and go somewhere else. Now during the time of the Great Tribulation, uh, the beast power is going to control buying and selling. Uh, you could read about that in Revelation uh, 13, verse 16 to 18. Uh, you can't buy or sell if you got the, unless you have the mark of the beast, the name of the beast, and over his name. Does that mean that Philadelphian Christians are going to starve? Uh, no. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 33. In Isaiah 33, we can see that God promises to provide what's necessary for his people. Verse 15, Jeremiah 33. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, who despises the the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes. I find that gesture to hands is interesting because I get criticized by anti-church God people for using my hands when I speak. Who stops his ears from hearing the bl of bloodshed and his eyes from uh, shuts his eyes from seeing evil. People who are not trying to watch violence, violent sports, uh, encouraging that, etc. He will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him his water will be sure. And the Church of God, at least since uh, sometime in the 20th century, for many decades in the 20th century, they were teaching this as related to the protection of Philadelphian Christians during the time of the tribulation. And if you're in Isaiah, I'm going to read verse 20 of chapter 45. 
It says, assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, you who have escaped from the nations. Particular Church of God group in the uh, early 1980s, late 1970s, uh, and after that, said, oh, you don't have to go anywhere. You can be protected where you are. Well, this says about escaping for the nations. So people are escaping and going somewhere. And there are still groups out there who have uh, the wrong attitude toward this. Furthermore, those who think that they're, they're so smart and God's going to just let them know or they'll know for sure because they're so smart and so close to God and they're independent and they're better off being independent, they're wrong. They don't have the love of the brethren. If you're an independent, don't think you have the love of the brethren that you need to be a Philadelphian. Uh, you, you should support the true work. It's working to fulfill Matthew 24, 14, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of the God of the world's witness, uh, going through the open doors that Jesus said, uh, reaching people throughout the world, teaching whatsoever Jesus commanded. If you go to the book of Zephaniah, you're going to read some stuff about this. And remember, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, so don't eliminate this because it's an Old Testament scripture that you may not have paid much attention to. It says, gather yourselves together, Zephaniah 2, verse 1. Yes, gather together, O undesirable nation. Now, even though it's got some misunderstandings, the Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary realized this was talking about some kind of religious group. So let me read what they said about Zephaniah 2, verse 1. Gather yourself together to a religious assembly to avert the judgment by prayers. Okay, so that's what it says. Now, when are they supposed to gather together? Well, Zephaniah 2, verse 2 says, Before the decree is issued, or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the days of the Lord's anger comes upon you. We're talking about gathering together prior to the start of the Great Tribulation. This gathering takes place before the day of the Lord, which happens two and a half, after, two and year, two and a half years after the Great Tribulation begins. Those who think that they're going to figure it out on their own are deceiving themselves. That's why most Christians at the time of the end have deceived themselves, are going to go through the Great Tribulation. Jesus warned about that. In uh, Hebrews 10, verse 23, you don't have to go there. I'm going to read from God's Word translation. It says, this was from the New Testament. We should not, excuse me, let me read it again. We should not stop gathering together with other believers as some of you are doing. Instead, we must continue to encourage each other even more as we see the day of the Lord coming. And we're closer to that than ever before. Now, who does God want to gather together? Well, the end time Christians. I want to read something from uh, John 15, verse 19 that Jesus said. If you're of the world, the world will love its own. But because you're not of the world, I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now I also want to go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Now 1 Peter 2, it looks like I've got this from the Old King James Version. I'm going to start reading in verse 9. But you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, oh, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now obtained mercy. You're supposed to be part of the people of God, not just independent over on your own. This is a peculiar people the world does not desire. Now I'm going to read from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the first uh, couple of verses here. The Apostle Paul was inspired to write, now, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as from us as though the day had come. This gathering together happens before Jesus returns for Christians. Now, how do we know Zephaniah 2 is related to Christians? Well, I'm going to go back to Zephaniah 2 and I'm going to read uh, the first part of Zephaniah 2. Verse 2, verse 3. This is what God inspired Zephaniah to write. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, you who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Now, you don't just uphold 
his righteousness or, or his justice by living as a Christian and keeping the Ten Commandments. I already read the two passages, uh, two passages from the book of Revelation, Revelation uh, 12, 17, and Revelation 14, 12, about people who are going to get persecuted during the time of the tribulation. They have the testimony of Jesus Christ and they keep the, the commandments. Justice would include reaching the poor, both physically as well as spiritually. And we do support the poor both ways in the continuing church of God. You're not upholding His justice just by taking care of yourself. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Now, why does God tell them that they might want to be gathered together? Well, the second part of Zephaniah 2, verse 3 says, It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Now, I want to make this absolutely clear. Just being a member of the continuing church of God does not mean you're going to be protected. It means you could be protected, and hopefully you will be protected, because hopefully uh, you're praying that you'll be accounted worthy and doing what God wants you to do. Now, another thing that's interesting about Zephaniah, that word actually, his name means Yahweh hides, or Yahweh is hidden. And so I think it's interesting that those who are going to be hidden are those who are going to gather together. So I think that's uh, consistent with that. Uh, various other Church of God writers have written about this. Um, this is somebody who basically said that there's two groups, Philadelphian Christians and Laodiceans, that are contrasted. And some are going to be protected, the Philadelphians are protected, and the uh, others uh, are, are not. Getting back to Zephaniah, it says it's going to happen when the de decree is issued. I believe that the decree will happen through a, a leader in the continuing church of God. I believe it's going to happen after Matthew 24, 14 has been fulfilled to God's satisfaction, which says, by the way, Matthew 24, 14 says, the gospel of the kingdom will increase the world as a witness and then the end will come. Uh, the Jewish sacrifices, which will be resumed, will have been stopped by then. The abomination of desolation will be set up. And uh, the decree will probably be a decree that it's time to go to a place uh, in Matthew 24, 15, it says, The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stands a holy place, whoever reads them understand. We can also see the same thing in Mark 13, verse 14. But keeping in Matthew, uh, verse 16, here's what Jesus said in Matthew 24, starting verse 16, Then let those who are Judea flee the mountains, let whom is on a housetop not take anything out of his house, let him who is a field not go back take his clothes, woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight not be in the winter or in the Sabbath. Now it's interesting, this comment about the Sabbath, it's talking about the end time. This is not talking just about Jews who are converted later, which is what some Protestant commentaries have foolishly said. Jesus is talking about people who are still keeping the Sabbath, which would be His people. By the way, we have a booklet on the Ten Commandments at the www.ccog.org website. It goes through some of these anti-Sabbath arguments, which are ridiculous, in my opinion. But the tradition, however people have accepted this nonsense. But Jesus said to pray your flight would not be on the Sabbath, which He would not do if the Sabbath was done away. Verse 21, For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no nor shall ever be. And why is God going to have a decree issued? So people will know this is the time. But who's going to make this de decree? Let's go to Amos chapter 3. Verse 7, Surely the Lord God, Yahweh God, the eternal God, does nothing unless He reveals His secret to His servants, the prophets. A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? So I appear some type of prophet is going to make this particular decision, this decree. The only church of God that I'm aware of who teaches all this, by the way, in the 21st century is the continuing church of God. Oh, don't get me wrong, other churches of God believe those scriptures are valid, but they don't seem to tie them all together with this type of thing. Now, many people are going to discount this and scoff. And most churches of God don't have, don't consider that anybody could be a prophet. And those who have claimed, other churches of God groups who've claimed to have a prophet, uh, such as uh, Triumph Prophetic Ministries, uh, uh, Church of God 
prepare for the kingdom of God and PCG, their prophets have all been shown to be false. But if there were only false prophets, there wouldn't be any. Okay, God uses prophets and does still have some, but people would actually pay attention. But many people scoff and uh, will not accept prophecy in the time of the end. The end is going to come. Um, I'm going to just briefly mention that the book of Habakkuk says that something's going to happen to a highly indebted nation. And if you're an American, you've got the most indebted nation of humanity's time, and the debt continues to increase. And that's not a good thing. Uh, ultimately, it's not going to work out well. Uh, the Bible says the United States will be taken over for that. You can read that in Habakkuk 2, verses 6 through 8. I've personally been uh, warning about the end-time risk of Habakkuk 2 longer than any living Church of God leader that I'm aware of. A group I was in started to teach it, but then later backed away from teaching it, and I think that's an error on their part. Um, let me go to the book of Joel. Let's go to Joel chapter 2, and I'll read a few passages from there. A lot of people in the end times lack the motivation and humility to make the necessary changes. Well, if you come to a church like the even Church of God, people are going to make fun of you. Uh huh. People made fun of early Christians. People made fun of many of the people in the old radio church of God, and they all scattered too. And later the worldwide church of God. Anyway, Joel was inspired to write, Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing babies, let the bridegroom go out of his chamber and the bride into her dressing room, let the priest minister to the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach, that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the people, Where is their God? So Joel was inspired to write that the faithful need to gather together so that nations apparently will not get them. He was talking about, for example, like the king of the north ruling over them. It remains my prayer that those who are Philadelphian and are scattered in those groups will assemble together before it's too late. Sadly, many groups, who Christian groups, uh, Church of God groups, do not understand biblical prophecies correctly. We have an article on the Laodicean uh, church era where we list dozens of prophetic errors that other groups have that will prevent them from knowing when the Great Tribulation is going to come until it's too late. You might think you know. But if you rely on any false traditions and you rely on things that are not scriptural, that you will not know. There are all kinds of warnings that we need to gather together, believe the truth, and reach people and have the right work. Now, where is the place I'm going to read something that David was inspired to write in Psalm 27, verse 5. You don't have to go there. David wrote, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Now, that might have dual meaning. It could be referring to the tribulation. It also might be referring to an event that happened during the, when, the time when David fled from Saul in uh, 1 Samuel 23, verses 25, 6, 27. Uh, Saul went out to meet him. They told David. He went down to a rock. He stayed in the wilderness of um, Maon. He made haste to get away from Saul. He called it the rock of escape. Well, the word translated here as rock is Selah. And it's basically a Selah of escape. There's a place called Selah. It's technically now we tend to call it Petra or Petra. It's in the wilderness. It's a desert place. It's desolate. It's a rocky uh, outpost. Now, I should comment that some have alleged that the idea of Petra and a place of safety were some kind of invention from the late Herbert W. Armstrong or his wife Loma. That's not the case. It's long been understood. I'm going to read something from a Roman Catholic book called the Book of Destiny. Uh, and this has an imprimatur, by the way, if you're Roman Catholic talking about Revelation uh, 12, verse 14, says he's given two wings of a great eagle. This intimates rescue by an airplane. The great eagle uh, is going to, that may be sent, could be a powerful airplane to bring citizens home. God promises to trust those who, into him, as he'll take them as wings of eagles. He'll allow the woman to fly into the wilderness. The wilderness is a heathen nation. So, basically, uh, this Catholic book, which is a book, a pretty thick book that I own, it's about goes through all of the Book of Revelation, and it says 
The eagle will protect and shelter the church during the reign of the beast. The place of safety for the woman. Okay, so Catholics call this the place of safety. That's, they don't know where it is, and most of them don't understand this concept, but this is again in the book with an imprimatur by it. I was talking about 1290 days, which is time, time, and half the times in this particular commentary. So Roman Catholics say, hey, there's a place in the wilderness. Maybe you'll take airplanes to get there. And it's in a heathen nation, which means it's not part of uh, Israel. Uh, even the Rames New Testament, they're talking about this. Their commentary says, the church shall flee as to a desert in Antichrist time. And so, again, I want to bring this out, not because I'm trying to tell people we need to believe Roman Catholic doctrine, but to explain to people this was not an invention of the late Herbert W. Armstrong and his wife Loma. Okay, it's been out there for a long time. Uh, they also had uh, one of their prophetesses, uh, Anna Catherine Emmerich, in October 1820, said she saw a secret society uh, undermining the church and near them a horrible beast concealing in a cave. I believe that particular prophecy was inspired by Satan for people to be against those who are protected in the wilderness. And she's not the only one. There's another Catholic prophetess. Her name is Hildegard of Bingen. She wrote one also, I believe, warning against true Christians. She says, and fly from those who linger in caves. Now remember, just a few moments ago, I read you from the Rames New Testament and from another Catholic book that Catholics teach, hey, it might be in a wilderness, in a cave, or a desert, or something like this. And she says, flee for those who linger in the caves. They're the supporters of the devil. Woe to them. They're the devil's very guts. The advanced guard is son of perdition. So what certain Catholic prophecies teach, by the way, is that during what we would call the Great Tribulation, the Day of the Lord, there'll be people who are protected, the real Christians, and that after them, the Antichrist is going to come. No, after them, Jesus is going to come, uh, as we can read about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 4. But she warns against them. She says, avoid them with all devotion. She says, the serpent feeds and clothes them by arts. Well, remember, I mentioned that the Bible says the water, bread, water will be provided and the bread's going to be sure. God's going to provide it. She's saying, oh, this is from the devil. He says, they pretend to have sanctity. So they look good, but they're being deceived by the devil. And they look, they look good. And so... And he, she uh, sat with them. She calls them evil deceivers who labor to subvert the Catholic faith. Well, the time of what's going to happen during the tribulation, you're going to have the two witnesses out there, and they're going to say, look, the church from the beginning till now is a true church of God. It's the one that contends earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And those who are protected in a place of protection in the wilderness are going to support the two witnesses. The two witnesses perhaps will visit them sometimes. Uh, who knows? But they're going to be supporting the same message. And this Catholic prophetess, uh, I think around the 12th century, said, oh, warning against them. And I believe she was demonically influenced. Now, it's possible that some people will ignore Hildegard's warning. Of course, real Christians will. But it may be that some of the Laodiceans are going to try to go to the place. You can read about that in Isaiah 56, verse 8. It says, The eternal God who gathers the outcasts of Israel says, Yet I'll gather to him others besides those who are gathered to him. So yes, it's possible that some of the Laodiceans or others may eventually get there. But if you're counting on this, that's a mistake. Jesus said to repent. So you don't have to go through the, the tribulation. Uh, and that's what people should be doing. Uh, furthermore, during the time of the Inquisition, in the 13th century, one of their inquisitors, his name is Bernard Giodonis, he, learned, he said that there's a, this Antichrist is going to be persecution, and that... God will hide the elect spiritual individuals so they cannot be found by Antichrist and his ministers. And the church will be pretty small. So that's what persecuted Christians were telling the, Inquis in the Inquisition people. So this idea that the church is going to be protected, be small at the time of the end, is not a new idea. It's not some invention of uh, the late uh, Herbert W. Armstrong. 
Um, there are other, other prophecies and other writings. There are some Mayan writings that support this idea as well, which I'm not going to go into this. But I would like to read something from late 2nd century, uh, or 3rd century. There's a Catholic bishop named Victorinus. And here's what, uh, what he wrote. It says, but the, this is about Revelation 12. But the woman fled in the wilderness where she's given two wings of a great eagle to that church and let them go to the place where they have ready and let them be supported there for three years and six months in the presence of the devil. So that's not a brand new concept. Cyril of Jerusalem is considered to be a saint by the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox. In the fourth century, he taught Antichrist can reign for three and a half years only. And we're talking about the saints going there for time, times and a half. And he says that, uh, that this is this, this, this particular period of time and this protection is available there. Now some Protestants believe that there is a place, some type of place of protection. The late Protestant scholar, Dr. Uh, Wolverd wrote, Matthew 25, 4, 15 to 22, some believe that there will be a specific place in the desert that Israel can flee. No, Jesus wasn't talking to Israel. He's talking to Christians at this time. Okay? And people like the late left behind guy, uh, Dr. Tim LaHaye, wrote that various commentators suggested Jews are going to flee to Petra uh, during this particular time. Satan's final war will fall on the believing Jews, the rest of her children who keep the commands of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So that particular Protestant saying, oh, well, there's two kinds of Christians. Those who keep the commandments and those who don't. Well, no. The ones who don't, who don't try to keep commandments, those aren't real Christians. But so he's trying to get away with that and say, by saying, oh, that's just Jews. He's in, in error. And there's other uh, uh, Christians. There, uh, excuse me. There, there will be Christians who will be protected, but there's other Protestants who've written about this kind of stuff, and they think it's going to be Petra, and they think it's only the Jews are going to be protected there, again, because of Jesus' statement, Matthew 24, verse 20, about pray that you're, you will not have to flee uh, at the, uh, uh, on the Sabbath. Back in the time of the second century, uh, when he's talking about the millennium, Irenaeus, who was a Roman Catholic and uh, Eastern Orthodox saint, as well as a Protestant, usually consider him one. We in the Church of God don't, but he said, Now the promises were not announced to the prophets but in the fathers alone, but the church is united to from these nations, from whom the Spirit terms the islands, because they are established in the midst of turbulence, suffer the storm of blasphemies, exist as a harbor of safety to those in peril, and are a refuge to those who love the height of heaven and avoid Satan in the depth of error. In the third century, the Catholic uh, theologian uh, Apollotus also wrote about uh, the church fleeing into wilderness. He says this refers to uh, 1,260 1, days. The tyrants, the reigns, the persecute the church, which flees from city to city and seeks to conce seeks concealment in the wilderness, into the mountains, uh, on the wings of two great eagles. And as I said, I've this this is not a, a new idea. Okay. Now I mentioned Herbert Armstrong, so I'll read some stuff from him back in '68. He wrote 1968. This is from a letter dated September 1st, 1968. Petra may very well be the site for God's protection of His people, who are kind of worthy to escape. Uh, and, oh, I'm sorry, that's from a letter May 8th, 1956. Now, on September 1st, 1968, he said, apparently many are carelessly supposing there is sure to be protected the Great Tribulation, whether it's in Petra or another place. Many feel carelessly secure that they have it made. You don't have it made. You're still being tried to determine whether or not you shall have this protection. It's those led by the Spirit, not those who are led by desire for more and more physical material things. So hundreds of you are slacking off in your responsibilities of God's work. And he repeated that a couple of times. And people have slacked off in responsibilities toward God's work. Now as far as it having to be Petra, or Petra, depending on how you want to pronounce it, in 1982, July 16th, in a letter, let me read something that Herbert Armstrong wrote. 
I know many of you have your hearts set on going to Petra as a place of safety during the soon coming Great Tribulation. Well, get your minds off of Petra, brethren. I've never said that Petra definitely is the place of protection God will take us. I hope it's not. One reason it would be a place, it could be the place, it's a place no one else would want to go. It would be most unpleasant, uncomfortable, miserable place you could go. There's nothing desired there, but just in case, it says, well, I have some favor from the Jordanians, and we'll see. The late uh, Dr. Herman Hay suggested it was in rocks and it could be Petra, and some others have suggested it as well. But let's go to Isaiah chapter 16. Instead of reading uh, what others have written, let's read what uh, other church God leaders have written. Let's read some stuff from the Bible. Isaiah 16, starting in verse 1. Send the land, lamb to the ruler of the land, from Selah to the wilderness, to the mount of the daughter of Zion, for it shall be as a wandering bird thrown out of the net, so shall the daughters of Moab at the fords of Arnon. Take counsel, execute judgment, make your shadow like the night in the middle of the day. Hide the outcast, do not betray him who escapes. You might recall to the beginning of the sermon I was referring to various scriptures, I read scriptures talking about escaping. Let my outcast dwell with you, O Moab. Moab would be the area of Jordan. By the way, Petra is in Jordan. Be a shelter to them from the face of the spoiler. For the extortioners at the end, devastation ceases, the oppressors are consumed out of the land. So we see that Moab hides the outcasts, those who escape and wander. Remember, we're supposed to pray to be worthy to kind of to escape. And maybe the governments of the world will thrust this out. Now, I want to go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 2, we were in verse six, chapter 16, Let's read, I'm going to read verse 10 only from this chapter. It says, Enter into the rock and hide in the dust for, from the terror of the Lord and the glory of His majesty. Again, it's talking about a place with rocks. was where you would hide during the terror of the Lord. Let's go to Isaiah 15. I want to start reading in verse 7. Read a little bit more here. They'll carry away the brook of the willows, for the cry has gone all around the borders of Moab. It's wailing to Eglim, it's wailing to Bear Elim, for the waters of Demon will be full of blood, because I will bring more upon Demon lions upon him who escapes from Moab and the remnant of the ant land. Now the term brook, which in the Hebrew is nachal, indicates a stream or a flood or something similar, and willows could be a reference to an area called uh, it's near Petra. It's called Wadi al Araba, which some people claim means the valley of the desert or the drainage of the willows. Okay, it's also called Wadi al Jed, if I pronounce that correctly. Now, this uh, Wadi al Araba is 180 kilometers long from the southern shore of the Dead Sea to the Al Aqaba in the south. And some of it might even go into Israeli territory. It runs past Petra to the west, and it's, somewhat, it's close enough to Petra, if you will, to be carried away to it. Now, Wadi is kind of a drainage area, or a low valley area that, uh, drain, that swamps when uh, flooded. Now, the closest one to Petra is called Wadi Musa, which means the Valley of Moses. It currently is not wet. Uh, but on a map, it looks like it would drain uh, into the Wadi al Arabah if it was wet enough. So it's possible something like that. Now let's go to Jeremiah chapter 48. I'm going to read a couple of things in Jeremiah. There are clues in Scripture about where this place is, but uh, again, uh, I agree with the late uh, Herbert W. Armstrong that it doesn't mean it has to be Petra in Jordan because there's other places in Jordan that may fit well. Jeremiah 48 verse 28, You who dwell in Moab, leave the cities and dwell in the rock. And be like the dove, which makes her nest in the size of the cave's mouth. Now, if you're a Westerner, or even if you're not, but particularly if you're a Westerner, you'd probably be more comfortable in the cities than you're out in the middle of the desert. Understand that the children of Israel grumbled and complained when they were out crossing over the deserts, and they'd been slaves in pretty harsh environments. Understand, if you're in the 21st century, and you've got a bed, electricity, running water, food, grocery stores, and all this kind of stuff, air conditioning, may not be super comfortable. 
Go down to verse 40. Jeremiah 48. For thus says the Eternal, Behold, one shall fly like an eagle and spread his wings over Moab. Now, Petra, by the way, is south-southeast of Jerusalem. And that's a possible direction for the place to be. However, because Petra is one of the leading, if not the leading, tourist destination in Jordan, uh, that may not be the spot. It may be that the Jordanians say, you can come, but not there, or only there a little bit, or maybe there's not a lot of us. Maybe they'll put up with it. But come be somewhere in that general area. Now, we're going to get final training there. Uh, Christians, as I said, it's not going to be easy uh, to be there. If you're in Jeremiah, let's go back to Jeremiah 12. I'm going to start in verse 5 to read a few other things uh, about it. Jeremiah 12, verse 5. If you've run with footmen and they've wearied you, how will you contend with horses? If in the land of peace, in which you trusted, they've wearied you, how then will you do in the floodplain of Jordan? So in other words, if persecutions before you go to the place of protection that bothered you so much when you mostly had more of what you have, how are you going to handle it when you have to go to Jordan? For even you brothers, the house of your father, even they have trailed treacherously with you. I didn't read all the scriptures from on persecution in Daniel 11 uh, verses 28 through 35 or 36 but talking about being betrayed and this is consistent with this yes they've called the multitude after you remember we'll see uh, we saw this in uh, Revelation chapter 12 uh, 13 uh, 14, 13 through 16 do not believe them even though they speak smooth words to you when it's time to go people are going to say hey no this isn't the time well, don't follow that decree whoever's telling you that's a false prophet don't listen to them because they will misunderstand Scripture and say certain things didn't happen. And don't think you're so smart you're necessarily going to get it. When Jesus was around, the, le the Jewish leader said, look, he didn't fulfill this Scripture, he didn't fulfill that Scripture. He's not it. It's not the time. He's not the Messiah. Well, when it's time to flee, people are going to say, oh, no, that church isn't right. They have this wrong, they have that wrong. Don't listen. You need to gather together before the decree is issued so you'll know it'll be time. And you'll know what to do again when it happens. Um, now let's go back to Zephaniah chapter 2. Shortly after, it talks about the meek of the earth being protected in verse 3. We're going to go down to verse 8. Because this seems to also confirm a possible Jordanian location. I heard the reproach of Moab and the insults of the people of Ammon which they have uh, re reproached my people and made arrogant threats against their borders. Therefore, as I live, says the Eternal of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be like Sodom and the people of Ammon like Gomorrah, overrun with weeds and salt pits and perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall plunder them and the remnant of my people shall possess them. This they shall have for their pride because they have reproached and made arrogant threats against the people of the Eternal of hosts. So we see that, you know, God records that Moab's supposed to shelter his outcasts, but Moab's got pride. And because of their pride, they're going to be stricken. And it may be that they may betray some of us. We'll see what happens. And Moab's not going to be an easy place to live in, as I said before. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 26. I'm going to read verses 20 and 21, and then something else in Isaiah. Come, my people, enter your chambers, and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. Again, we're talking about, yes, during the time of the tribulation of the Lord, God has a plan to protect his people. But they're hiding in the chambers. They're not up in heaven. Now, since we're in Isaiah, let's go to Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65, verse 13. Therefore, says the eternal God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but you shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but you shall cry for sorrow of heart, and wail for grief of spirit. 
So despite hardships that are going to be there, God's people should rejoice because you'll be able to survive and get through it. Let's go to the Psalms. Let's go to Psalm 107. I'm going to start with verse 2. Let the redeemed of the eternal say so. The redeemed, those who God is going to protect. Whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the lands. So again, they're not just in one spot. Uh, just one country. Or they're not staying in their spot, their country is what I mean to say. From the east and the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted in them. They cried out the eternal in their trouble. Remember, Michael, the archangel, is going to stand up and help his people. We read about this, that God, that we will have to cry out for protection. And he delivered them out of their distresses. He led them forth by the right way that they may be, go to the city in a dwelling place. So it could be that there'll be some time, there'll be some, spend some time uh, in a city. But also, uh, there's other things that are going to happen. I'm not going to read Revelation 16, 16 through 20, but there's going to be a great earthquake and cities, are, the nations are going to fall and mountains are going to be destroyed. So there might be a time that we won't stay in the same place. Philadelphia Christians may end up going somewhere else for, for a period of time. Now, if you stayed in Isaiah, I'm going to go to Isaiah 66. Remember, People like Hildegard of Bingham don't want people to support what's going to be happening by these people. But they're going to be doing some kind of a work. Isaiah 66 verse 19 says so. That's why I figure that some of the things the demons told Hildegard to say were partially correct. Isaiah 66 verse 19. I will set a sign among them, and those among them who escape, again we're talking about people who escape, I will send to the nations, to Tarshish, to Pool, to Lud, who draw the bow to Tubal and Javan, to the coastlands afar off, who have not heard my fame or seen my glory, they shall declare my glory to the Gentiles. Doesn't this sound like the people who go to this place are going to preach the gospel once they leave it? Isn't it logical the ones who get to go to the place are the ones who supported preaching the gospel of the world prior to that time? You might give some thought to that. In uh, Matthew 24, verse 42, Jesus said, Watch therefore, if you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. And in verse 46, he said, Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, finds so doing. And in Mark 13, verse 33, you don't have to go there. Jesus said, Take heed and watch and pray if you don't know what time it is. Now I want to go to Ezekiel uh, 14. I'm going to read a few verses there, so you might want to go there. I'm going to start with verse 13. We see a warning here. Ezekiel 14, verse 13. Son of man, when a land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off its supply of bread and set famine on it, and cut off the man and beast from it. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the eternal God. So don't think that your spouse, your husband, your brother, father, mother, sister are going to protect you. If you're not right with God, God's not going to have you protected. Well, you might think you'll follow somebody, but something will happen. So they would deliver neither... Verse 46, excuse me, verse 16 of Ezekiel 14. They would deliver neither sons nor daughters, only they would be delivered, and the land would be desolate. In Philippians 2.12, Paul wrote, we're supposed to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, the continuing Church of God believes that the 18 restored truths that uh, the late Herbert W. Armstrong said that God had him restore to the Philadelphia portion of the Church, as well as placing the right priority in proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God, that the, the CCOG has the true Philadelphia mantle at this end time group. But again, just being in any church of God is not going to be a guarantee that you're going to be protected. But you are supposed to gather together before the decree is issued. There are several groups mentioned at the time of the end. 
and again, they're not all being protected. And these are uh, Christian groups. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. I'll read a few parts of this here. Uh, verse 18, we start reading about Thyatira. Revelation 2. Then in verse 22 it says, Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, lest they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. So there's an indication there might be some Thyatiran Christians around at the time of the end, and they're subject to be going into the great tribulation. Well, chapter 3, verse 1, we start to read about Sardis in Revelation. And it says in verse 3, Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. The main Sardis group is currently teaching. The main Sardis group is currently teaching that uh, all these things have already happened. Most of the Book of Revelation has happened, so you don't need to watch. And Jesus warned Sardis, "Hey, if you don't watch, uh, it's going to come on you. Uh, you won't know the hour, and they won't." Now. Let's go skip over to the Laodiceans, which are mentioned in verse 14. And then in verse 19, Jesus said, As many as I love, I rebuke, rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Now, understand that Jesus is talking to what? Christians. Okay? These are actual Christians. Not people who claim to be Christians. These are actual Christian Christians. These are the ones who have the testimony of Jesus Christ, keep the commandments of God. And they're all subject to the tribulation not being protected. But in verse 7, we read about the Philadelphians. In verse 10, Jesus says to them, Because you've kept my command to persevere, to do the work, to reach people, to try to love others, to do what we, I want you to do, I will keep you from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. While it's possible that some, of the, some in Thyatira and Sardis and Laodicea they might repent, it's only the Philadelphians that are promised protection during the Great Tribulation, which is the hour of trial. It's one of the reasons understanding church errors is important. And a lot of people don't understand church errors, but Jesus said, I'm going to tell you where he said this, and then I'm going to say what he said. Revelation 2.7, Revelation 2.11, Revelation 2.17, Revelation 2.29, Revelation 3.6, Revelation 3.13, Revelation 3.22. Jesus said, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. But people don't understand stuff about church errors, and they don't want to. And even the few groups that do seem to understand them seem to have major misunderstandings when it comes to the place of protection, a place of safety, and when to go. I'm not going to go through all the prophetic errors that other groups have, but essentially, there are some groups who believe you're going to be protected where you are, and that's not consistent with Scripture. Scripture says people are going to be gathered out of the nations and go somewhere else, so thinking you're going to be protected where you are, that's not the case. Those who are somewhat on the evangelical side, who are not Church of God Christians, they think you're going to go up to heaven, and that's not a wilderness. That's not the, that's not going to be. So they they won't know. So the Protestants won't know. The, some of the Catholics think it's it's centuries from now, so they're not going to know. Most of the Church of God people aren't going to know. As I say, some think that they don't have to go to a place. Others, oddly, and I'm not going to read this, but if you go to Daniel chapter 11 verses 39 to 43, they get this prophetic sequence backwards. There are groups who believe that the King of the South is going to be destroyed prior to the start of the Great Tribulation, or that is the start of the Great Tribulation, and then the United States gets destroyed, which is the opposite of what the Scripture says. Uh, Daniel 11.39 talks about the power of the strongest fortresses being destroyed first. Uh, in the 21st century, that's got to be a reference to the United States, not the Arabic King of the South, which we read about in uh, starting in verse 40 of... Uh, Daniel chapter 11. Those who are thinking that's the case are wrong. Those who think there only has to be 10 or 11 nations uh, prior to, for the Great Tribulation to begin that are going to form the beast power are wrong. The Bible talks about in Revelation chapter 17 verses 12 to 13 there are going to be 10 kings who don't have a kingdom. They're going to, there's going to be a reorganization in Europe and then they're going to give their power to the beast. That does not say 10 specific nations. Uh, it's extremely unlikely that Europe would break down to 10 specific nations. It's more likely we're going to see uh, regrouping on regional things. So people who are expecting that are in error. People who believe a physical temple has to be built prior to the uh, start of the Great Tribulation 
are in, in Jerusalem are in error. Yes, the Bible talks about sacrifices being stopped. So yes, that means sacrifices are going to be started. But no, the Jews do not need a big, huge temple like they've had before. The Jews have an altar. They're ready to sacrifice any time. So those who think they have to have a physical temple prior to that are not going to go. There are going to be many reasons that most Christians will not go. But mainly, God's, not going, God's going to allow them to mislead themselves because they have not supported the true work to get the gospel of the kingdom out of the world's witness. They've been part of Laodicean organizations or they've been independent or whatever and don't have the zeal that God wants them to have and they will not stand for the truth the way it needs to be done. I'd like to read something from the August 1959 edition of the old uh, Good News magazine from the old Radio Church of God. It says, God will set before us an open door, talking about the Philadelphians, and no one can shut. And God can shut it, and He will when the work is finished, and the Philadelphia work has gone to the place of safety. Now some people thought, well, once Herbert W. Armstrong died, the Philadelphia work was over. Well, that was not the position of the old Radio Church of God. Furthermore, I talked to the late evangelist Dubar Partian about this uh, as well. He used to do the French broadcast for the uh, old uh, Radio Worldwide Church of God and, uh, and other Church of God groups as well. And he said, oh no, Herbert Armstrong wanted the gospel to keep being preached after he died. And he appointed various ones to do that. I'm not going to read various things that he wrote at the end, but at the end he said the work needed to go through new doors. God was opening new doors and work needed to be done. Anyway, getting back to the 1959 article, it says, Philadelphia has a little strength to do this great work which God has given it to do. And it's not going to be, be by our strength, or our power, but by God's Spirit this is going to happen. Which, by the way, is one of the reasons I believe that the continuing Church of God has been the fastest growing Church of God in the 21st century. There's no other group that's even close in terms of our, our growth this century. Anyway, he also wrote, this is the late Leroy Neff in this magazine, it is the Church of Laodicea who had no vital part of the work of God today, even though they live today and are part of the generation which will see Christ return. There's various scriptures, by the way, that say, that I didn't read today, said the place of protection is not in the coastlines over uh, in Israel. If you put all the places together where the scripture points, it seems to point to somewhere in Moab, Jordan area. It may or may not be Petra, but it should, it's probably going to be near there. However, many people are more focused on the actual place than the importance of watching and praying always to be kind of worthy to escape all things. It's a time before the Son of Man, as Jesus wrote in, or said in Luke 21, verse 36. Only those who are supporting the true Philadelphia work of the Church of God and are truly Philadelphians are going to be protected from the hour of trial that's coming upon the world to try the world. Now, as Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3, verse 18, we all need to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so we can be accounted worthy to escape those things. But again, as Zephaniah says, we need to gather together before the decree is issued, the meek of the earth, so it might be that you might be protected from the hour of trial that's going to become around the world. Believe what your Bible says. I've given you some ideas. But yes, the Bible does promise protection for some Christians, and only some Christians, during the time of the Great Tribulation of the Day of the Lord. It's only the Philadelphia Christians that are promised that. It is those who have the love of the brethren, those who are truly working to fulfill Matthew 24, 14, Matthew 28, 19, through 20, and have the zeal that God wants them to have, and the love of the brethren, including the love of the poor brethren. And going through the open doors, whether we're talking about Africa, Asia, the Americas, uh, Europe, uh, the islands, Australia, whichever. North America, I don't want to miss any the continents. South America, I don't want to miss any of the continents and places in the Caribbean. Support the work. We're getting closer to the time of the Great Tribulation. A place of protection is promised for those if they would be true Philadelphia Christians and be supporting the true Philadelphian work. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.